Welcome to Iron Sharpens Iron. My name is Jeremy Nettles. I'm the evangelist for the River Ridge Church of Christ in Newburgh, Indiana. If you would like to stop by and visit us, you can find us at 5600 Van Road, and we would welcome you to our 10 a.m. Sunday worship or our 4 p.m. Sunday worship. You can also join us at 9 a.m. on Sundays and at 7 p.m. on Wednesdays for our Bible studies. We've been going through the end of Genesis. We're about to wrap that up, and then we'll be popping back over to the Gospels to spend a few months looking at Jesus' later ministry there. And we would love to have you join us. You can also get in touch with us by phone at 812-550-6234 or send an email to info at riverridgechurch.org. Those are both great ways to get in contact with us if you have specific comments or questions, or especially if you have requests for a topic that you would like for us to consider including on a future installment of this TV program. I love it when I get questions like that, and I take them very seriously, as I often say. Let's turn over to Galatians chapter 5, and as I'm turning there, I'll relate to you exactly how this came about. Somebody had asked me, essentially, what constitutes a sound church? And the reason that he asked was because he was looking at the options in his area and was having a hard time selecting one that seemed to check all of the boxes, so to speak, one that seemed to be the church that Christ established. And so his question, I suppose, amounted to this. Just how far off of the pattern, as I understand it, can a church be while still being a healthy church? A legitimate church in God's eyes. And so I wanted to start in Galatians chapter 5 to give us uh, sort of a beginning point. Galatians chapter 5, let's read the first six verses. For freedom Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. Look, I, Paul, say to you that if you accept circumcision, Christ will be of no advantage to you. I testify again to every man who accepts circumcision that he is obligated to keep the whole law. You are severed from Christ, you who would be justified by the law. You have fallen away from grace. For through the Spirit, by faith, we ourselves eagerly wait for the hope of righteousness. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision counts for anything, but only faith working through love. Now, it wasn't all that long ago that we looked at Galatians in more detail on this very program. And when we did that, we talked a lot about the problem that these Christians were facing. They had been led astray by a perversion of the gospel of Christ. This perversion suggested that, essentially, in order to become Christians, they really needed to become Jews first. It was suggesting that salvation wasn't only through Christ, but that it also required the keeping of the law of Moses. You can see how this would be a problem, and Paul is saying, no, this is not just a slight tweak that needs to be made. No, this is not just a minor mistake that you all have made, but you're, you're basically heading in the right direction. No, he says, you are severed from Christ. That sounds pretty bad. It doesn't sound like this is something that the church can simply weather. It sounds like if the church has taken this false doctrine at face value and especially if they're not teaching it, then the church is not really the church anymore. He says they have fallen away from grace. Salvation is the gift of God. That's the grace we're talking about. So he's telling them, essentially, you are forfeiting your eternal salvation by accepting this false doctrine, this what we might call a heresy. By attempting to justify themselves, they were debasing, devaluing Christ and his sacrifice and his achievements and his very godhood, I suppose. They're not headed in the right direction. They don't just need a minor course correction. They are well off the path. If you look around at any American town of significant size it will be quickly obvious to you that there are an enormous number of churches to choose from. Why are there so many? Is the problem that the churches just keep overflowing their capacity to fit people, and so they need to set up uh, new locations you know, down the street and around the corner? No, that's not typically happening, and it's definitely more the exception than the rule. 
I looked into these statistics trying to figure out what's the sort of average size of a church in the United States of America. And to be fair, these numbers seem a bit dated by about 10 or 15 years. It's not exactly clear where they originate. And they are probably lower by now, at least in my assessment. But what I found is that the median church size in the United States, again, as of the time of these numbers, is only about 75 people for Sunday attendance. And nearly all of these churches can fit more people in the pews. And practically all of them, if not all of them, would love to do so. So that leaves me with a question. Why don't more of these churches merge? If you've got uh, one church that's, let's say, 50 people, and another church that's, let's say, 60 people, and they would both love to be much bigger than they are, well, of course, they would love to, uh, to, be, to be converting the lost. They would love to have people coming in from the community. They would love to have atheists repenting of their ways and members of other religions changing and, and turning toward the living God. That's what they would love to see, of course. But there's also something to be said for just being a part of a larger group of a larger church. And people want that. Churches want that. So why don't these two groups, the 50 and the 60, join together? Now you've got 110. Isn't that better? Why doesn't that happen more often? It seems like a sure way to increase your average attendance on a Sunday. Well, mostly this doesn't happen because of doctrinal disagreements. It's not just that all of these people consider Jesus to be the Savior and uh, gather on Sundays to worship him. There is a lot more to it than that. And if one group, the group of 50, let's say, has a significant disagreement with the group of 60, and they can't agree on who's right, and they both think that their side not only is right, but that it's the only way, and that the other side is, well, definitely at risk of going to hell because they don't believe in the same way, it's, it's difficult to reconcile those two groups. Now, to be fair, many congregants, right, just your average everyday people, many of them, when they go around deciding which church is going to be their home, they're mostly searching for what they like or what they enjoy. But in general, that's not really the case for the leaders who are highly invested in any given congregation. In general, they have some degree of conviction about what is true, what is acceptable worship, what is God's plan for the salvation of man, and lots of other related things. And when these ideas don't line up from one church to the next, the result is division. If one side believes that only people with blonde hair will be saved in the eternal final judgment, and the other side believes that only people with brown hair will receive God's salvation, you can see how there would be some difficulty in these two groups of people worshiping together and forming one church. So that covers the doctrinal side of things. Similarly, on the more practical side, if one side of the argument thinks that it is absolutely essential that the believers wash each other's feet every Sunday or something like that, and the other side believes that it is sinfully immodest to uncover your feet, well, you can see how these two groups would have some difficulty reconciling as well. Now, of course, I'm using some pretty ridiculous examples there, but there are many such disagreements, often over things just as ridiculous as those two examples. Now, we should all, of course, be seeking to worship as God commands. The example of Nadab and Abihu in Leviticus chapter 10 should be enough to make that lesson very clear to us if we are willing to receive it. Let's turn over there and read the first three verses of Leviticus 10. These two men, Nadab and Abihu, were the sons of Aaron. Aaron, of course, being the first high priest of the Israelites uh, under the Mosaic Covenant. And Nadab and Abihu are a part of that first priesthood. And here we are, we're, we're at just the, the very beginning of the Law of Moses, of the, of the covenant between God and the nation of Israel. And what happens? Leviticus 10, 1 through 3. Now Nadab and Abihu, the sons of Aaron, each took his censer and put fire in it and laid incense on it and offered unauthorized fire before the Lord, which he had not commanded them. And fire came out from before the Lord and consumed them, and they died before the Lord. Then Moses said to Aaron, This is what the Lord has said, Among those who are near me I will be sanctified, and by all the people I will be glorified. 
and Aaron held his peace. What was their horrible offense? They offered unauthorized fire before the Lord, which he had not commanded them. Does that seem like a huge deal to you? It probably doesn't, but it seemed like a huge deal to God. He took this very, very seriously. Now, in fairness, we should consider the context, and if you were to back up in chapter 9 and see the, the offering that, that Aaron is making, uh, this is right as the, the priesthood is being consecrated, and uh, God is demonstrating his presence in, the, in, the, in the, the tabernacle, and it is in this context that Nadab and Abihu, outside of the purview of the, the commandments that God has given about when and how and why they are to make their offerings, they just decide they're going to up and offer incense. On top of that, it says they went before the Lord. Now, that seems to imply pretty strongly that this isn't just that they uh, were in the tabernacle court or at, by the altar of the burnt offering or even in the holy place, but that they specifically went before the Ark of the Covenant in the most holy place. Now, if you flip over to Leviticus 16 later on and read that chapter, you'll read about the Day of Atonement, and you'll find in that chapter the only time that the most holy place was to be entered. It was to be once per year. It was only to be done by the high priest, meaning Aaron and not his sons. And it was only for the purpose commanded. And yet these two, they've entered into the most holy place apparently, willy-nilly, without a care for God's commandments. And he does not take very kindly to that attitude. Additionally, as was evident in the passage in Galatians that we read from earlier, a major mistake in our understanding of the gospel could have catastrophic effects, up to and including being severed from Christ. Now, specifically, if I were to convince you that the only way into heaven was through circumcision, I would be teaching you to put your faith in circumcision rather than in Christ. And as Paul says, I would be then also implying that you were required to keep the rest of the law of Moses. Okay, so that's one mistake. That's a mistake that was being made in the first century from the very beginning of the church. But there are many more such mistakes today. Clearly then, what we need to do as we are searching for sound churches is to find churches that both preach and practice God's word, not their own ideas not the commandments of men. And the Pharisees and the scribes asked him, Why do your disciples not walk according to the tradition of the elders, but eat with defiled hands? And he said to them, Well did Isaiah prophesy of you hypocrites, as it is written, This people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. In vain do they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. You leave the commandment of God and hold to the tradition of men. We need to find churches that aren't offering vain worship. We need to find churches that are sound. What does it mean to say that the church is sound? Now, I earlier used the synonym healthy, and that's actually what the, the Greek term behind this word means, healthy. But we do occasionally talk of like a sound tree or something like that, or a sound structure or a sound mind in a sound body, that sort of thing. When we say that, we mean that there's no defect, no flaw that compromises the whole or renders it unfit for its intended purposes. We say this especially if the imagined defect isn't readily apparent at first glance. And this can be the case for churches, too. Around the time that the church had grown enough to face some serious struggle with division on a large scale, suddenly the word sound as an adjective, the way we've been using it, pops up nine times in Paul's letters to Timothy and Titus. He's not describing churches, but he's describing people's faith, and more importantly, the teachings that they promote. So let's, for example, look at uh, 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 3 and 4. For the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching, but having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions and will turn away from listening to the truth and wander off into myths. He's predicting that this is going to happen. He's predicting that false teachers are going to come and that they are going to preach lies and that 
they're going to be successful, that people are going to listen to them. And specifically, he's implying that churches are going to listen to them. Yet, even though Paul had written numerous letters to numerous churches, telling them that they were wrong about numerous doctrines and behaviors and attitudes, he never writes any churches off as having wandered entirely away from the faith, except for the Galatians. How can it be the case that churches who tolerated rampant sexual immorality, churches that tolerated racial bigotry, that tolerated selfish ambition, that tolerated divisive behavior and loafing and mooching and made rules that weren't imposed by God? How can it be that churches guilty of that and more would be considered sound? The reason for treating them that way isn't that all of their flaws are acceptable. It's that they didn't fully know better yet. When the apostle steps in and clears up any doubt, now they have a responsibility to shape up. What would have been the result if they had simply refused? Well, Jesus gives us a pretty good idea of this later on in the, the first few chapters of the book of Revelation. One of the churches to whom Paul had written a letter, Ephesus, is also addressed by Jesus in Revelation chapter 2. I know your works, your toil, and your patient endurance, and how you cannot bear with those who are evil, but have tested those who call themselves apostles and are not, and found them to be false. I know that you are enduring patiently and bearing up for my name's sake, and you have not grown weary. But I have this against you, that you have abandoned the love you had at first. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen. Repent and do the works you did at first. If not, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place, unless you repent. What's with the lampstand? As for the mystery of the seven stars that you saw in my right hand and the seven golden lampstands, the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches, and the seven lampstands are the seven churches. The lampstands represented these churches in the province of Asia themselves. When Jesus tells the church at Ephesus that he will remove their lampstand from its place, he means that at present the lampstand is there, figuratively speaking, before his father. It's a legitimate church. But if they do not repent, they will cease to be his body. They will no longer be recognized before God. Today there are no living apostles to tell us new revelations from God or to make binding decisions about the church and its work. Instead, we are all responsible to the words already revealed by Jesus and his apostles in the New Testament. No congregation will be entirely free of problems until we're all joined in one body to our head, Jesus, at his return to earth. But a sound congregation is one that continuously learns God's will from his word and revealed in his word and obeys, even if that means making drastic changes to preferred and preconceived beliefs and doctrines and practices. Most of the churches you see around any town don't look all that much like the church of the first century. They're filled from end to end with man-made doctrines and practices that seemed like good ideas when they began, but are much like the unauthorized fire that Nadab and Abihu used in their worship, which offended God. Not because it was so obviously contradictory to his prohibitions, but because he had not commanded them to worship in that way. We are so quick to rationalize, to make excuses, to ask, who's it hurting? To opine that God would certainly approve because it seems good to me. Does that always work? Let's look at another Old Testament example in 2 Samuel chapter 6. 
And David arose and went with all the people who were with him from Baal of Judah to bring up from there the ark of God, which is called by the name of the Lord of hosts, who sits enthroned on the cherubim. And they carried the ark of God on a new cart and brought it out of the house of Abinadab, which was on the hill. And Uzzah and Ahio, the sons of Abinadab, were driving the new cart with the ark of God, and Ahio went before the ark. Sounds pretty good, right? David's just retrieving the ark. He's uh, getting it ready to, to be placed in its new home in Jerusalem. Everything is hunky-dory here, right? Never mind that God had told them how to transport the ark. You can find that in Exodus 25, verses 13 through 15, also in Deuteronomy chapter 10, verse 8. Specific people were supposed to transport the ark. It was the Kohathites. They were supposed to transport it using the poles that God had specifically built into the design. Never mind also that God had specifically told them not to touch the ark. You can find that in Numbers 4.15. It doesn't specifically mention the ark in that verse, but verse 5, a little earlier in the chapter, does clue us in that the ark is among these objects not to be touched. Now, to look at it from the perspective of David and the sons of Abinadab, you'll go, really? Who cares? That was 400 years ago. Get with the times. No one uses poles to carry things around anymore. We have fancy new technology called the wheel. And I'm sure God expects us to update his commandments in order to reflect the times. Except, well, what happened? Verses 5 through 7. And David and all the house of Israel were celebrating before the Lord with songs and lyres and harps and tambourines and castanets and cymbals. And when they came to the threshing floor of Nakon, Uzzah put out his hand to the ark of God and took hold of it, for the oxen stumbled. And the anger of the Lord was kindled against Uzzah, and God struck him down there because of his error, and he died there beside the ark of God. Poor guy. Really, though, he is just one of many who should have said, hang on now, didn't God tell us to do this in one particular way? Why are we substituting our own idea? But he was closest, and he did what anyone else would have done in his position, and God was displeased with all of them. But he bore the brunt, because he's the one who actually reached out and touched the ark. The law of Moses is not our law. I just went over that in Galatians chapter 5, right? But it does tell us a lot about who God is and what to expect from him. The ordinances don't apply to us in the same way. Now we're free, right? We can do what we want. No, 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 no. Is the heroin addict free? But he's doing exactly what he wants. What he wants is to be stoned. And what is he? He's stoned. He's getting himself a fix all the time with no regard to responsibility, with no regard to uh, the, the health of his own body. It's all about that pleasure in the moment, and that is exactly what he wants to do, and he's doing it. He is free. But really, he's become a slave, hasn't he? He's not entirely in charge of his own body. He has given over control. Instead of his mind being in control, his body and his most base passions are in control. In the passage that kicked us off in Galatians 5, we read, For freedom Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. Paul's talking about the law there. So that seems to undercut my point. But no, it really doesn't. Let's look later in the chapter. For you were called to freedom, brothers. Only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh. But through love, serve one another. For the whole law is fulfilled in one word. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. But if you bite and devour one another, watch out that you are not consumed by one another. But I say, walk by the Spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. The freedom that Paul expresses is the freedom from the droning law of the type expressed in the 613 ordinances in stone in the law of Moses. Yes, of course, but the broader picture remains. We are not freed from the law so that we can gratify the desires of the flesh. We're freed from the law 
and freed from the desires of the flesh by submitting our will of our own choosing to the one who made the law in the first place. It's not the freedom to do what you want to do. That leads to all sorts of sin. It's the freedom to choose what you ought to choose rather than being compelled to do it and restricted by outside forces into doing it. God still has expectations of us, and if you will read the New Testament, you will see what they are. This applies in our own individual lives, but it also applies to the churches and to what they practice and to what they preach. So what can you do if you discover upon comparison with the pattern in the New Testament that your church is violating God's instructions or adding its own instructions atop them? The answer isn't always as simple as we would like, but the first step should be to inform them. If it is a sound church, it will correct its course to fall in line with God's will rather than man's. If that doesn't happen, then you have to ask yourself, will I hitch myself to a group whose lampstand Jesus has removed from its place? Now, this isn't an excuse for you to go out and church hop or to church shop. Those are both bad practices. It's also not an excuse to build your own church that consists of you and your own immediate family, although I've seen that happen a number of times. Occasionally, the best thing you can do is to worship with a group that does some things that you can't do in good conscience. But if that's the case, you should discuss the issue openly and clearly abstain from those practices while trying your best to encourage a broader change in the group. Don't be belligerent about it. Don't be divisive. There's, of course, always the chance that you're the one who's wrong, isn't there? And that the rest of the church is on the right track and that you're the one who needs to change. And if that turns out to be the case, then you still need to play by the rules of your conscience, but you don't want to create a stumbling block for everybody else. Other times, the best thing that you can do is to move on and to look for the New Testament church elsewhere. Examine your own conscience and your own motivations and give yourself first to the Lord and then to his church. That's what we're trying our best to do here at River Ridge. You won't find any pizza parties or basketball games here. And since we're reasonably sure that the New Testament church service didn't closely resemble a rock show, neither does ours. You won't find much discussion of the writings of St. Augustine of Hippo or of Thomas Aquinas or Martin Luther or Charles Wesley. But you will find a group of people studying the writings of the apostles and prophets and doing our best to interpret them accurately and to encourage each other to live them daily in our lives. If you'd like to join us, we would welcome your presence. We're not on this earth to please ourselves. We're here to worship God. You can find us at 5600 Van Road in Newburgh at 10 a.m. and 4 p.m. on Sundays. We also have our Sunday Bible study at 9 a.m. and our Wednesday one at 7 p.m. If you're not local, there are others nearby you who would love to help you as well, and we can help to put you in touch. If you have further questions or comments to share with us, or would like to sign up for a more involved study in person, we would welcome that too. You can reach us by phone at 812-550-6234, over email at info at riverridgechurch.org, or on Facebook or YouTube. I'd love to hear from you. Thanks for joining me today on Iron Sharpens Iron. <laughs>